Okay, so we've all heard certain nuggets of knowledge that make us say to ourselves, wow, I never knew that. <laughs> well, we have a feeling you'll be saying that a lot after meeting our next guest. John Reisinger of Easton is the author of the book, The Secrets Behind the Structures, due to be released later this year. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you very much. So the secrets behind the structures. Tell us more. Well, structures sort of like people usually have a long story behind them, they, how they came about, what happened once they were built, and all the rest, and a lot of them are weird and bizarre stories. And as an author and a retired engineer, I've been collecting these stories to put in the book, Secrets Behind the Structures. Wow, okay, and yeah. you've got a lot of stories here. Yes. Let's start with something local, the Chesapeake okay. Bay Bridge. Yes, well probably everybody on the Eastern Shore has heard of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge right. one way or the other and know that it has sort of a tangled history behind it. Uh, there was a lot of struggles that went on before anything was built, and one of the big ones was uh, the Port of Baltimore. I was very interested in not having anything to interfere with the port, and they wanted the bridge to be a tunnel because they were afraid if there was a hurricane or something and the bridge collapsed, it would block the ship channel and oh, okay. paralyze the city of Baltimore and the whole economy would go down the tubes. And it wasn't that unreasonable an idea. Uh, they were also worried about submarines in case there's another war. This is right after World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a big struggle between whether it was going to be a tunnel or whether it was going to be a bridge. The original idea was for a three-lane bridge, uh, the way they built the second one, three-lane bridge, uh, and because a tunnel was so much more expensive to make three lanes out of it, uh, they weren't. A they did the bridge instead. Uh, but they wound up with a two-lane bridge because the underwriters who did the financing said, "Well, we don't want to put up that much money because you know what? They'll never. It'll never generate enough traffic to pay for itself." <laughs> Uh, really? This is one thing all through the history of the, of the bridge until they actually built the thing, everyone was saying, eh, why, why does anybody want to go to the Eastern Shore? Uh, uh, they'll never generate enough traffic. Uh, so, uh, and one, uh, one uh, legislator said, well, we'll just buy a couple extra ferries. So, oh so that went on, on for, for, uh, for quite huh. a while. Uh, and of course it was, you know, and while they were building it, one of the ferries crashed into the bridge. So it didn't knock it down, but it, it sort of made the uh, the Port of Baltimore people say, yeah, see, we told you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, okay. if, you, if you look at on the bridge today, and you, you may have noticed that it curves at the end. Yes. And this was a concession to the Port of Baltimore uh, concerns, too, because uh, you can see it in one of the pictures I have that uh, uh, a ship going through it, the reason it was done that way is that the main span where the big ships go through, uh, they wanted it to be perpendicular to the ship channel. In other words, if you're piloting a big ship through there in a fog or something like that, you need a wider you, space you to don't, get through. Well, it's not just a wider space, but uh, you don't want the bridge to be at an angle because then you never know if you're really going the right way or not. Uh -huh. So it's okay. a little disorienting. Gotcha. Uh, so that's so. In order to make the main span go perpendicular, they had to curve the rest of the bridge. Okay. Right. So you the, also have some fascinating information about the Holland Island Bar Light. Yes, the Holland Island Bar Light uh, was one of the approaches to um, Chrisfield. Uh, it was almost in the middle of the bay. It was way out there at the bottom of uh, by Holland. Island Bar, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was a screw pile lighthouse, the kind of at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum has, uh, and it was manned light station. And in 1931, the lighthouse keeper, a fellow named Ullman Owens, was found dead in the lighthouse. The place had been turned upside down. It was a shambles. Everything was broken. There was blood splattered all over the place, but they couldn't find a wound on the guy. And they couldn't, and they never knew whose blood it was or anything. And uh, there was a lot of talk about, well, maybe it was bootleggers because he may have been, they thought he was reporting them to the Coast Guard or something like this. It was 1931, so prohibition was going on. And uh, they never actually, saw, they, they put it down to natural causes. They figured he had a fit of some sort, a really bad one, apparently, mm. and never really solved the, the case. A few years later, in 1957, the Navy actually, this was a, bail, a hard luck lighthouse, the Navy accidentally bombed the lighthouse. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Some Navy sky raiders came down from uh, Atlantic City and there was a target ship, sunken ship a few miles away, and this was at night, and they just got it mixed up, and they dropped some dummy bombs down. Didn't do any real, didn't hurt anybody, but uh, it, it made the people in the lighthouse seriously consider a new profession. Well, I guess so. Uh, so, and there's there's sort of a, of a weird postscript to this. That's a postscript to the first story. So it's a postscript to the postscript. Uh, I thought it was an interesting case, and since it was never solved, it kind of left it wide open. So I wrote a book about it called 
uh, death at the lighthouse, which right. is actually a mystery, and, and uh, that way I can solve the case and fix yeah. in a fictional way. But right. all the basic uh, information is, is the same, the basic facts. I was doing a book signing, and I told the story uh, about the Navy accidentally bombing it, and one of the ladies there said, oh, I know about that story because my husband was one of the pilots. Oh. And I said, oh, I'll bet he got yelled at. <laughs> Well, and, John, I gotta tell you, we could do this all afternoon. <laughs> you are full of these stories, and it's amazing. Let us give you a couple real quick. Just give us a real sure. quick fact about some uh, Eiffel Tower. Eiffel t uh, Tower uh, was also very controversial. All the artists in town wrote a, a letter saying that they didn't want it there because it's ugly. Uh, <laughs> it was sold for scrap at one point by a con man. But the story that that, that I like is that uh, when the Germans conquered Paris in 1940, Hitler came to town sort of partly as a tourist and partly as a conqueror because he'd never been to Paris before. And their idea was, hey, we're going to go and have, have a photo op. And he wanted to go to the top of the tower overlooking his new conquest. Well, the French weren't having any of that, so they sabotaged the elevators. And he said, if you want to go to the tower, it's 1,600 steps. <laughs> And I have the official picture you may have seen in the history books of Hitler and his entourage posing in front of the Eiffel Tower. Oh. And that's why that picture was taken that way. They, for the rest of the war, the elevators were, uh, were not working. They'd been sabotaged. And every time the Germans got after the French, they said, well, it's the war. We can't get parts. Oh. Within hours of the, of the Allies taking, the cap, taking Paris back again, suddenly the elevators started working. Huh. Go, go figure. Go figure. <laughs> I don't know. Isn't that amazing? John, thank you so much. There's so it's much amazing. more information we thank wanted you. to cover today. So, so the book is coming out later this year. It's Secrets Behind the Structures, John Reisinger of Easton. And if you'd like to more, read more about it, go to delmarvalife.com. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing.